So hello, good morning, Anne, and good afternoon, Sam. It's good to have you here in the conversation because you're both so fascinated by algorithms, by patterns, by mm, a lot of things that for me are a little bit um, understand, difficult to understand and a bit weird. But I would like to introduce first, Anne, what are you doing today? What is your main job today and, and how are you working also in relation to companies making that brand identity working with all that technology um well we work with uh, uh a lot of uh companies as their creative partners so we work with uh, uh dior cartier isi uh, nike viton um and our projects they originate in identity, but then uh, they expand into uh, architecture, interiors, facades, uh, or all kinds of, for example, even master planning. Um, and uh, our approach is about technology, uh, and we're looking for creative way to use it. So I, I can tell a little bit more like what kind of tricks we're using, but uh, right now there are uh, kind of three ongoing projects that we uh, do with and we try to to use with all of our clients. Uh, one is uh, visual exploration that actually allows us to look closely at images, at existing images of the company. And since we work so much with uh, large brands that have this amazing history, it's really a lot of materials that we can look at. And we devise different uh, technologies uh, or build custom databases to look at these. The next one is work with patterns, and the most recent one is transforming this into time, actually being able to look at the development of uh, uh, shapes and patterns uh, in time. Sam, it might be a good uh, thing to talk about that, to understand where you would like to go with technology. It well, I suppose from a background point of view, I'm, I'm, I approach projects and work in a similar way to Anne. I, I, but that kind of process usually lends its way towards um, the actual production product um, and also the, the sort of creation of um, the sort of philosophy of behind why that product needs to exist. Um, so from that point of view, um, I go quite deep into the history of philosophy, um, history of sciences, algorithms, why people make the decisions they make, um, how humans behave. Um, and through this process, I have worked with a variety of brands um, uh, in tandem with the University of Central London um, and their Institute of Making. Um, and this year, I just, I've been sitting on these projects for a while and um, I kind of just wanted to really start to explore them a little bit more. Um, and some of the, the, the projects themselves are, like the one you mentioned, the, the image of thoughts is, um, basically challenged the idea of um, the fallibility of language. Um, I've always found, I suppose from a, a macro level, I've always found computers and algorithms quite a beautiful thing. Um, luxury, fashion, art really struggles with technology. I think they find technology not very sexy. Um, and unfortunately, um, these sort of things have hampered the, the growth of projects that I've wanted to do in the past. Um, so this this point, I just decided that I would actually go ahead with it. Um, I work with um, this creative algorithmic processor. Um, he's based in um, uh, Canada, um, between Canada um, and America and New York. Um, and together, we wanted to challenge looking at the works of Derrida, Wittgenstein, the fallibility as an initiative language. So we started to put this project together where we took um uh the evolution of language we showed how like language itself potentially can be affected by um invasions by um uh cultural slurs changing of languages and what we wanted to do is we wanted to see that sort of track of evolution towards what language was doing and then push language even further and see if we can get closer to meaning as wittgenstein wanted in tractatus he wanted to find what language potentially could do for us and not be so constricted by what it's actually doing organically, really. Well, <laughs> tell me, what was your reaction? Why? 
Um, well, I think that's the most interesting things that happen when, you know, they happen by chance. So you do something very intentionally and you set up a process and then something goes wrong, right? And, uh, uh, and we're, <laughs> or, or maybe we just, you know, we're kind of clicking away. Uh, I think the, the worst thing is to be very serious while you're, uh, uh, you're working. I know that you are uh, in, interested in errors, the error of weaving, the error of, and so on. C could you go deeper in those, uh, in that concept, Sam? Yeah, I mean, I always find there's an argument that people always make that um, the reason why creativity through um, humans is always going to stand out above creativity over um, um, robotics or algorithms is that there's the, the fallibility of error is what makes human art beautiful. Um, I've always been quite fascinated by this and the more that science has kind of read into it there's the, the big thing that I've kind of been processing the most is this idea of the um, non-free will. So everyone believes that they have the free will to make the, every decision they make but ultimately through a variety of tests, which I'm not gonna go into all of them because there's a lot and it would take quite a while to explain, but actually there's, there's an argument to say that we don't actually have free will. Um, all the decisions that we made are, make are based off um, nurture, our DNA, processes that occurred for us in the past. Um, so if that is the case, and everything that we're doing, even the mistakes that we're making are, they're kind of already outlaid for us to, to process them and do them. Now, there's no reason why you can't do the same thing with computers. Um, things like chaos algorithms. Um, there's an artist that I've always loved called um, uh, John Cale. And uh, John Cage as well. John Cage and John Cale both mm -hmm. used to produce um, this thing called prepared piano, where they'd take equipment and they'd put nuts and bolts and scissors and stuff, and they'd be able to re resonate noises that were not what that instrument was supposed to do. And in theory, it's just processing error into that instrument. So for me, it was like, how do you take that to the next level? How do you start making errors um, through something that is seen as so perfect, um, but it really isn't because you can cause a lot of mischief and um, problems by putting code errors into algorithms or into machinery, like I mentioned, like weaving machines. So I just find that quite interesting. Yes, 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 for sure. It's actually also, I love uh, uh, this work and you know, it seems that machines can actually be much more creative than humans, but it's always in the interaction between humans and computers, how you uh, program and how you interact with the computer. And that's actually where uh, uh, we try to sort of subvert the, the way a program is working, right? So uh, you can uh, uh, say that, you know, like a, any computer program that uh, we use, it was built to do certain things. So you can draw a rectangle or you can, you know, move or scale it, right? Uh, but how actually you can play against uh, this program and uh, do something that was not predetermined to do in it, right? So if, you know, it's, it's uh, this kind of interaction. I was just going to say, um, it's the same as, um, yeah, what Anna was saying is bang on. It's like, People often talk about how important craft is, and I love craft. It's like I have another business that focuses on the encouragement of craft. Um, but people obsess over the historical processes of craft and machinery and hat, mat, like man, woman putting their hands together and making something. But all of those things are exactly what Anne said. That is still the same process as using a machine or a tool to process something through human thought. Now, doing that same process in, in algorithms or within high level machinery. It's exactly the same process. So it's just the next level up of craft, basically, for me. I, I know you're both interested in 3D printing. How do you see the connection with uh, algorithms and the errors? Well, Some. lots of errors happen um, in 3D printing, for sure. Uh, but oh, yeah. I think that going into this, uh, uh, you know, like what kind of machine is used, right? If we are uh, talking about computer, then we're producing uh, bits, we're producing, hopefully we're producing meaning, right? But uh, uh, if we start to talk about, you know, how we make, uh, how we build things that we designed or how we uh, weave or how we make, uh, you know, kind of matter basically out of the computer that's it's a computer completely different uh story in terms of you know what kind of errors can happen right and it becomes like already way way more complicated Sam you were also 
I'm hoping to do uh, objects as an artist, I mean, artistic work. How do you feel about that with 3D printing? Is it working? Can you have a try? How, at what stage are you in, in this process? Again, I, I've got a printer in Switzerland that I'm working with at the moment and it is, it's on trial level because I think, I mean, the things that I want to do with 3D printers um, have to take a lot of trust by the person who owns the printers because I kind of want to put material through them that isn't conventional to go through material printers. You spoke a little bit about this um, Anne herself quite serendipitously was interested in running clay and cement through machines. And um, I've been trying to, ultimately 3D printers will print anything that can become liquid form. So metals, um, I've seen work by some artists who like melt down the processes that they're using to generate the 3D and then reprint that into uh, an item. So anything that can melt down and do it is is game, but it's, it's it's making sure that those people who own the machines are like, okay, yeah, we can clean them afterwards, or it's not going to break the thousands of pounds worth of machines. So yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're close. And and what is your latest uh, project that you like so much? Um, well, the latest thing that we built, actually, that's the thing I sent you this morning. Uh, so that's, uh, um, it tracks uh, development of form in uh, time. Uh, so kind of to go back a little bit, what um, uh, we are trying to do, you know, since we always work with, uh, with computer together, right, we're... Uh, 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 trying to understand how actually what's the best way to do it and you know the typical thing if you work with any program is a kind of command response right so you always back and forth right and uh, another way is you know you can use uh, an existing algorithm so something that already like Branoi for example right an algorithm that sort of has a certain look right that you can use and that's why we can very easily recognize both uh, design that is uh, made with this back and forth uh, uh, process. And we can uh, recognize visually parametric design. We can recognize these algorithms that we know already. Uh, so for us, in a way, it's not, not a good way because we work with uh, brands that all have to be differentiated from each other. They all have to be uh, unique and look different. We cannot allow any certain recognizable look that would be the same across different brands. Uh, that we work with. Uh, so what we're trying to do is uh, build these kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, they, maybe they're black boxes in a way, right? You put something, some input uh, on one side and you get uh, a result on the other. But this is completely custom built uh, uh, a bit of code that is uh, done for a specific project. Uh, and before th we have been always uh, working in 2D uh, and then transferring it already by hand in, into 3D like thinking about materials, etc. Uh, and I always felt that uh, the process itself is so much more interesting, the way the form is put together. So now we're trying to actually capture it and uh, see how form can develop in time. Uh, so get this kind of time object that uh, uh, not only happen as, you know, one uh, image, right, but it's um, continuous. Uh, so that's... Uh, that's in, in a way what, what was interesting. And I think part of it was um, this uh, lockdown and, you know, and the fact that, you know, we could no longer make these things that are, uh, you know, like, for example, facade in a store. You know, a person walks around, so the object is uh, stands still, but it's still animated through the movement of the person. Uh, but... Um, if we don't have that, uh, then the movement has to be somehow built into the object itself. Yeah, there, there is a link between you, not only the technical, but also the fashion element, you know. Um, Sam, you're a designer, you have your own brand. Um, uh, Raymond, you have also, uh, you do a lot of consultancy lately. I heard you're quite busy. Yes, that's good news. And um, <laughs> I think, and so I wanted to ask you a little bit about then the, the shift in fashion, like high fashion, luxury, all those big brands where Anne, you are working for. Sam, talk a bit about your consultancy and how your brand is doing and, and what you actually 
Um, how do you feel about fashion today? Be careful. be careful because you want to be the speaker's corner, and this is the speaker's corner. So we we have to say what we think here. Yeah, go. Okay, for it. <laughs> I'll try and be as um, yeah, um, PC yeah, come as on, chill down. Um, <laughs> so I suppose when you you talk about um and being someone who can actually say something for free like in terms of being uh, i'm trying to work out the best way of putting this but i suppose <laughs> being freelance to me trying to be free being freelance to me which has been probably i mean so i used to work for a luxury brand um in the last few years um and i was based in house before then i was freelance i had like a, a load of different consultancy gigs and i had started at my own brand which i got investment for um, I came back earlier this year, obviously, to what happened with coronavirus. And as you know, I've been getting more and more disillusioned with the industry itself. Um, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute. But um, I think also basically what, what happened was with my brand, we had our second season. We had a really good season. We took like 40 stores. We're a brand new brand, which is really good. We were picking up like some really good department stores and luxury boutiques. Obviously, coronavirus happened. All of those were wholesale. Banks wouldn't lend us any money. Um, everyone cancelled um, their orders, or if they didn't, then like I said, I couldn't get money from the banks to loan on because it was too, too much of a volatile market. The whole world kind of changed. Like I was thinking, I, I, I really value the life I lead in London. I really love it here. I found the city I was in quite restrictive. Um, I found what I was doing quite restrictive and the industry quite difficult and I thought this is really troublesome um, and to cut a long story short this year has kind of really changed that I think more companies now have become aware that um, it is possible to work abroad it is possible to have people digitally com communicate and design it is possible to I don't know work in this way that involves like less physical presence and more like openness to innovative ideas that come over um come online so for me like working freelance has been really good i think it's in some ways like i suppose with being freelance you're free to say what you want like um there is still that that fear of like longevity to the work that you have but i suppose in terms of that like now it's enabled me to be more like selective with who i work with um I think in the past, like for other companies, especially like you kind of, if you work in, in a house, like you, I think you start developing almost this like Stockholm syndrome of like, in effect, going along with that house's narrative, go along with the house typologies, like um, what it is to like deal with sales, like buying led, like who the consumer is. And then I think ultimately, like when you're in that bubble, working in luxury, um, you sort of sink deeper and deeper and deeper into this reactive design decisions, which is probably the only way I can really put it. And the the collections start from a point of view that's now mirroring the consumer rather than creating something new and groundbreaking. And because like because ultimately, like I suppose new and groundbreaking is a risk and a risk means money and risking money is like the equivalent of playing Russian roulette with your career, I suppose. It's like it's really scary and I think I think for me now working in this way and now there's this big shake-up in the industry where I don't know I f yeah I think freelancers now are really vital to businesses because it's important that they come in to shake the sort of status quo of the brand and like ultimately it's I suppose it's like a fresh set of eyes for the company like you're you're somebody coming in with a completely different aspect from a completely different maybe cultural um, notion, seeing a planet at the moment, which is shut down literally in different times of the, in times of the week, day, month, everything changes. So I think it's really important. And I think at the moment, I think people are starting to notice that maybe I was saying something right <laughs> before all this <laughs> happened and now they want a piece of it. I don't know, <laughs> but yeah. You see, there are always good things in the bad things. It's always love and hate. And it's always a struggle. If something happens like we had this year, some good things happen as well. I mean, like 
I was writing those containers. I didn't know what it was going to be. And here we sit talking to each other. So it, it is sometimes a break that we need and a shake up to, to say hello in the morning. What are we, what do we want with our lives? Where are we going? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I was just, sorry to interject. I was going to, before no, I missed the good. point, I was going to say no, no, like, um, yeah, exactly what you're saying is, I don't, it's, it's really weird. I mean, it's not weird how we've got into it, but that idea of you valuing product that you've owned for 40 years, like the idea of craft and consideration of design, like somehow, well, obviously through neoliberalism, mass manufacture, mass consumption, we've now been kind of blindsided towards what is important in design. And I think for me, like, I mean, I know I mentioned before, when we were talking about this before, you mentioned this idea of wild designs being important. And I think, sorry, wild ideas. And it, I was gonna bring up this thing then because I put a note on it, but um, I think wild ideas are really important and shaking up the industry is really important, but ultimately like why wild ideas need to be grounded in understanding. Like they need to, like my research it starts with like philosophical writing, economic models, social engagement, ethical processes, like, um, like historical design. And I think to do those wild ideas, we also need to understand where those ideas have come from and to know where we're going. So like, for example, like we know, like I've mentioned, uh, for me, hom homogeny is one of the, the worst things in design at the moment. It's, it's killing the industry. Like it, it's, it's basically this whole industry was built on this idea of having self-expression and individuality. But like brands are so, so scared at the moment of doing something new, like and trying something that's different to what everyone else is doing. And I don't know, it's just really, re really, really hard. And I think for this to have an effect, it's like you said, like, in the past you've grown up valuing like quality and design and like something that's timeless like i think to change that we really need to like i think we're doing it now but i think we need to go deeper into like this new idea of awareness like from i don't know how things are being developed why things are being developed like um uh, why it has its place in society its meaning its innovation like i don't know all of these things i just think it's I, I think the only way this will ever change is if like there is a monumental change politically, ideologically, I think mass manufacture needs to be considered. Off, we did this to ourselves with offshoring, but I don't know until that sort of stuff is levied and controlled and businesses are more inclined to sell better and less, then we're gonna, be we're gonna find it really difficult to overthrow this sort of mass consumerism at the moment. Sorry, that was a bit of a tirade, but yeah. Nothing is impossible. Yeah. It's just to believe in it and be enthusiastic and convincing. Um, and do we, are you optimistic with your with with your research? Because you you found now that new, well, you found now, <laughs> but maybe there are uh, smaller brands who need you. I mean, I don't know. Can yeah. I? Yes. Yeah. No, but when Address. you're talking about environment, I am not very optimistic, unfortunately. <laughs> and we had no. we have a three year old, and uh, uh, I uh, don't know how things are going to be when she grows up. So it's very, um, uh, very tough, and in that sense, right? It's very, uh, and uh, I guess you know I'm coming from the sort of old world because you know I was. Uh, uh, I was brought up in uh, Moscow and actually among uh, grandparents who were um, who went through uh, grew up during the First World War and then went through all of the disasters of the 20th century. So it was always kind of looming large and you know just in the last maybe uh, 10 years, I kind of got uh, uh, stopped thinking about all of that and you know like in a, in a way like and now with what happened i think uh there is this feeling of you know of change and i'm not sure if you know if that if that is going to be a uh, a good change but but at the same time when we talk with uh people we work with a lot of um uh, uh companies in um san francisco and in, in the bay area and uh there the feeling is completely different the feeling that it's actually uh all of these things are an opportunity to uh to do businesses that are around uh environmental issues around cleanup around uh um 
so I, I guess you know all of this would be just you know another another boom of different technologies that uh, uh, deal with cleanup and deal with uh, development of new materials and uh, new processes. Yeah, in fact, we made a mess out of it. That's true. Uh, it's a bit um, we were unconscious, greedy, and we were not really thinking about the globe. Now, if we plant a tree every day, maybe we resolve the situation. But I don't have the the. I have a garden, but I forgot to do it. So maybe we should find new technology to to have a, a tree that we can plant. I don't know where to to save the situation of the world. But it's. I think what our work is and and what your work is, it's always about passion. You know. It's passion that drives us, and and for you, that 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 drive that that can bring a, the brand identity to a better level. I think we have to be positive in a way. I mean, you can't think about all the negative things. So, is the speaker's corner a solution to say what we think aloud? It's really important right now, personally, because I think. I mean, as, as you kind of touched on then, like I've been growing really disillusioned with the industry. Like, I mean, as you know, Linda, I mean, you more than anyone because you've started this whole container project because of your disillusion with the industry. So I I think I, I thought when COVID hit, I kind of myself felt like one of those like, um, like frustrated prophetic soothsayers where I was basically I, don't, I mean, I've been working on projects for like the last four years, like I said, with the UCL and the Institute of Making and all this like material innovation departments, because I, I just really wanted to see a change happen. Um, that's what drove me aesthetically, functionally. Um, and I could see how behind the times the whole luxury industry had become. Like I saw this massive gap that was being utilized within automation and architecture. Um, and I kind of saw all this stuff like, I mean, innovation, material design, economic models, marketing, like all this thing. And I was trying to bring the luxury industry into the future and kind of let it embrace progressive innovation and technology. But apparently that's way easier said than done because it was difficult. Like nobody wanted to budge on their old methods. And yeah. as we said, like technology isn't sexy. Like it, it wasn't no. sexy at the moment, but now yeah. Now you see the whole industry like, and it's frustrating because you see the whole industry now panicking. Like they're trying to jam yeah. like round pegs into square holes and are desperate for yeah. the technology to be sexy for them. Yeah. But they just don't know how to do it. And like, I don't know, it just seems really disingenuous. And when you start seeing like Chanel without naming names, like you, you see Chanel try and do this like 360 digital, like catwalky 3D affair things. and. I'm just like, what, have you just gone on to like Future Laboratory, clicked to, who does 3D shows, we need to do this because this is technology. It's like, you can be smarter than that. Like you don't have to, your consumers aren't people who are gonna log into like your 3D show and get a VR headset to scan themselves into a thing. It's like, be smarter. But I believe like this opportunity allows people like myself and Anne to, I don't know, come together and actually start to like, find the right unrestricted platform to show our thought and our design process and actually let it have influence. I mean, Anne's already does have influence because she's got like all the biggest names in, in the yeah. industry working for, <laughs> for working for her. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. for me, I need them. So <laughs> here I am. <laughs> you know Sorry, what? Anne, the yeah, sub the, the subtitle of my project of the containers, it's connecting people. So connecting, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that this is a good connection. Yes, yes. Actually, I had a uh, uh, because you were talking about uh, in your project about chaos algorithms. Uh, uh, it kind of ignited another round of discussions with my dad, who is uh, he's mathematician, and that's actually his topic. He's uh, specializing in nonlinear systems and uh, in patterns, uh, pattern study in uh animals insects and how they develop uh, but always the the discussion stops where the numbers begin because i cannot understand any of the formulas uh, so i think that you should uh, really push harder and you know get uh, 
get this going. But in in general, maybe uh, maybe the solution is also to produce uh, less fewer materials things and more uh, uh, more things that we can. Uh, kind of enjoy digitally, right? <laughs> so the, uh, yeah, I think it's possible. Uh, maybe Let's this enjoy, is part of yeah. the... Uh... So I think we can conclude and say, let's enjoy the digital. I thought it was a good conclusion. <laughs> Sam? Yeah, let's yes. enjoy life and, and the digital. Thank you both. You were great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank Great. you. Thank you beautiful. so much, Linda. And Sam will try to maybe catch up and discuss maybe some. Uh, yeah, uh, we have to uh, go further. Uh, yeah, because we, or some, um, we could do another hour of talking. We could do a Zoom talk at some point, couldn't we? Um, and, um, I'd love to introduce you to the guy that I'm working with, who's a, a creative algorithmic processor, because um, I think you'd love his work. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to show. Mm -hmm. Yes, would be awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good. Have a nice day and a nice evening. Thank you, Boj. Big kiss. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. <laughs>